Hello, in this video we're going to take a look at the history of evolution. This material doesn't come from uh, either of our textbooks, and so you'll be responsible for what we cover in the lecture. This will be part one of a two-part video, I believe. So I'm going to open up my PowerPoint presentation, and we'll get started. So we're thinking about uh, evolution. And this is important because if we're going to focus on the evolution of social behavior, we have to understand a little bit about evolution. How did people come to think about evolution and understand what it is? And then what are some of the mechanisms of evolution? So we'll start with just a historical perspective. And we'll start by asking the question, well, what is evolution? Now, if um, we want to go with the simplest answer, the simplest answer is it's change. It means change, right? A broad biological definition would be something like a change in the form and behavior of organisms over time. A change in the form and behavior of organisms over time. We're going to talk more about this definition in a couple of videos. Uh, but Darwin called this concept descent with modification. That meant that the forms of organisms have been modified from their ancestors. So modified their DNA, their behavior, their physiology, their morphology, etc. And one ancestral form could give rise to many new forms, a branching-like concept um, that we think about when we think about evolution. So you've got this one ancestral form that undergoes change over time. And with more change over time, we get a variety of different organisms that have um, different forms, different um, physiologies, different behaviors, and are so different that they don't breed together. They're different um, species. So we um, say that Darwin calls this concept descent with modification. He actually didn't even use the word evolution maybe more than once in his first book. He called this concept descent with modification. Okay, well, we need to know a little bit more about the history of uh, of our understanding of evolution um, in order to, to kind of see where Darwin came from. This is just a figure that describes some of the important um, moments in time when we're thinking about uh, evolutionary biology. And so, so you see the timeline here, late 1700s to late 1800s uh, is really the time when our theory of evolution developed. And we'll talk about a few of those people. So <clears throat> let's think about the history of evolutionary biology, at least from the Western world's perspective or worldview. Before the 1800s, natural theology was kind of the, um, the norm, right? The Western worldview, if you will. And natural theologians were people who um, attempted to understand God by, and all of God's wisdom by studying nature, right? And the assumption here is God is a stable, unchanging God, and so therefore we must live in a stable, unchanging world. Makes sense. And so that is kind of the worldview at, uh, by which we, we, we viewed everything in the world in prior to the 1800s. And so natural theologian was looking at organisms in the world emphasized the following things. They said that species never change. So species don't change in their form or their behavior over time. They are unchanged. They're stable, just like um, the world we created, that God created, is stable. And species don't go extinct. There's no extinctions. There's no new species arising. So no, the origin of new species, doesn't, that doesn't happen. And um, this 
worldview emphasized um, that species are just unconnected, they're unrelated. They were created by a creator at one point in time in an instantaneous act. You know, all of the species were created. The way they were, the way they are, they're not changing. All right, that's the um, world in which people in the 1700s, 1800s, that's what, what the Western theology was like, okay? A Western worldview. Into this world come people like Carl Linnaeus, living in the 1700s. We call Carl Linnaeus the father of taxonomy. He came up with uh, a naming system and an organizational system uh, that classifies all of the organisms out there in the world. <laughs> At first, um, Linnaeus believed that species are fixed and unchanging, much like the um, the natural theologian worldview. But after studying, in particular, plant hybrids or plant hybridization, he kind of modified his beliefs. He says that hmm, it looks like species can change, but change is not open-ended. It's not unlimited. It's it's small. What does Linnaeus's hierarchical system look like? Well, first of all, Linnaeus named every organism with a two-part name. Okay a genus and a species name. Our name is Homo sapiens. Dogs are Canis familiaris. And then he grouped indiv uh, individual species into ever bigger or broader categories and um, came up with some of these names, not all of these categories, but came up with categories like, hey, um, dogs belong in kingdom animalia, the animal kingdom. They're chordates. They have a backbone. They're mammals. They produce milk. They're carnivores. So they're in kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, class mammalia, order carnivora. What family are they in? They're in the dog family, can candidate. And they're in the genus canis. And their name is canis familiaris. Or Perhaps they're the same species as wolves, um, but a different subspecies. In any case, he came up with the idea of this two-part of binomial nomenclature and the idea of grouping organisms by um, what they look like into bigger and bigger categories or into smaller and smaller categories. But what's interesting is we can see um, evolutionary relationships between uh, we can see evolutionary relationships in these in this ordering process uh, so for example if we look at the carnivores the order of carnivora okay these are all mammals you can see that the family and the genus and the species here we we have a cat family okay we have a dog family and in that family are in fact you know foxes and and and, and wolves um, we have all of the cats, the big cats in this family. There are evolutionary relationships in this, um, in this naming process, really. Be maybe uh, Linnaeus didn't necessarily intend for that to be the case, but it, it kind of is. So Linnaeus um, started thinking about classifying, organizing um, organisms by what they looked like. Today we focus more on their evolutionary relationships, but he started the process out. Another researcher living in the 1700s, George Cuvier, uh, focused on studying fossils. Now fossils are impressions of organisms that lived in the past, right? Most of the time they're found in sedimentary rock. There are all different kinds of fossils. There weren't a lot discovered yet in the 1700s and early 1800s, but people were really starting to find them. And <clears throat> as Cuvier studied uh, these fossils, he came up with some conclusions. One of them was that, gosh, this world seems really old. Another interesting thing he saw was that some fossil types are found in younger layers of the rocks and some are found in older layers of the rocks, but not vice versa. So if I flip to the next slide here, you, you can see that there are different layers in the rocks. And, you know, maybe he found some fossils that are only found in the youngest layers, and some, some fossils only found in the oldest layers, some fossils found in all of the layers. Okay, 
<clears throat> His major conclusions after studying this fossil record uh, were organisms do go extinct. Yeah. There do seem to be extinctions where there is a there are there is a particular species in the fossil record and it just disappears. Why does it disappear? Cuvier suggested it was because of catastrophes. He called it catastrophism. Ooh, this is gonna be messy. Catastrophism. Local catastrophes, a flood, a volcano, a meteorite, wiping out species in that given area. But he didn't believe that species could evolve. Well, how did new species appear in the fossil record? They migrated from other areas. You know, a big catastrophe happens, a bunch of species die out, new species move into the area by migration, they don't evolve. But he started thinking about um, using the fossil record, studying the fossil record, and thinking about uh, history of organisms on this earth, and I think that's really important. James Hutton and Charles Lyell, okay, lived in the 17 and 1800s, both of whom are geologists. They didn't like Cuvier's view about catastrophes. They looked at geology and, um, you know, at land formations, mountains and giant um, canyons and such. And they decided that geological change is not the result of a big catastrophe, but it's very, very slow. We might call this gradualism or uniformitarianism. Geological change is very slow. Big changes, like the formation of a mountain range, are going to occur as a result of the accumulation of very small changes over time. A giant canyon, like the Grand Canyon, forms slowly as the rock, as the river erodes the rock so that the canyon slowly, slowly, slowly gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. What does this have to do with Charles Darwin and evolution? Well, this idea really influences Darwin, this idea that change is slow or changes happen slowly over time and little changes accumulate to lead to big changes. That's when Charles Darwin started believing about organisms. Small changes accumulate to lead to big change okay. over time. Oh, one other really interesting thing is that Hutton also suggested that animals or organisms evolve too, and even suggested a mechanism that sounds a lot like natural selection. And so you can kind of see this um, uh, bit of information that looks a lot like Charles Darwin's work in, in, in some research before Charles Darwin wrote his um, most famous book, Origin of the Species. All right, the Comte de Buffon, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I don't know French. Uh, in any case, another um, individual living in the 1700s helps us understand the time frame or the time period in which Darwin was living. Uh, this, this guy decided to write down everything the world knew about nature, <laughs> about the natural history of organisms. And he decided to compile all of them into a giant encyclopedia. Unfortunately, he didn't finish that before he died, no surprise. But um, he did come up with some ideas. He said, look, the Earth is old. The Earth has a history. Life on Earth has a history. We need to start thinking about the history of life on Earth. That's pretty important because I think the worldview the natural theologian worldview is it doesn't matter, you know? Here are the animals, here are the plants, here are the organisms that God created, and they don't change. This guy is saying, wait, let's look at how, it, what happened over history. 
He decided that species do change as they encounter new habitats. They're encountering new habitats because of things like migration or changes in climate. But um, how do they change? He didn't really know. He came up with an idea that was something like this. Particles that made up animals could change, leading to changes in the animals. He wasn't sure. The important thing here is that um, this researcher started thinking about life as having a history and that organisms might change over that history. That's part one of the video. We'll take a look at part two next. I can get out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs>